Greetings, Zimbers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If this is your first time here and you're enjoying what you are hearing or you've been here and not done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods and Middle of Nowhere Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. I'll try my best to recall this story that just popped up in my memory randomly. This would have been in the late 90s in Connecticut, maybe about 1998. I was a teenager and some of my friends had started getting driver's licenses, so we did what any teen in the 90s did, drive around with our friends looking for something to do in a very small town. There were about five of us in a friend's car. I wasn't driving. I was in the passenger side of the back seat. We were riding around listening to music, talking. No substances were used. We were on a wooded, windy road at night. Suddenly, the driver slammed on her brakes, and we watched as this creature crossed in front of us. Illuminated by the headlights, the creature was about toddler height, very, very pale, no clothing, bald, and very slender. It paused briefly to look at us. I remember we all got dead silent. It passed the road quickly and went on into the woods. It walked on two legs. It was most certainly not an animal I'd ever seen, especially since it was bipedal and it definitely wasn't a little child. The only thing I can recall is its face. I did see the creature, but from my seat in the car, my view was slightly obstructed. We were all silent for a few moments, processing what we had just seen. I remember another passenger whispering, Dude, what the fuck? We continued on in silence with the occasional, Did you fucking see that thing? We kept the radio off at that point, and the driver started bringing us all to our homes. We were so creeped out, we didn't feel like having fun anymore. One of our friends nicknamed it El Chalupa, so occasionally we'd bring it up. I've lost touch with all of them at this point. I'm in my 40s now. But we never did find out what we saw. This was before most of us had even home computers, let alone a cell phone or Google. I don't know. Any ideas? As I'm sure most of you are aware, the hunting season for white-tailed deer is about to start this weekend. I've been spending a decent chunk of time in the stand with my partner, in life and in most ventures generally, because we've discovered that hogs have been rooting up the oats and generally causing havoc, and scaring away the deer from the feeder. We've gone out a handful of times in the last two weeks, attempting to catch the miscreants at it. So far, no luck. Very frustrating. At any rate, because of the hogs, I've been spending more time in a stand after dark than I ever have in my life. We've been up there from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and every other weird time slot you can think of. I mention this just in case it's relevant or helps paint a picture. There have been a few things that have happened that I've struggled to explain away or rationalize, and my partner is out of ideas too. The first thing happened about a week and a half or two weeks ago. It was around one or two in the morning with a decent chunk of moon illuminating the area. 
I was only half paying attention to my surroundings because I'd already written the night off as a bust. When all of a sudden, I became aware of a weird whirring and flapping sound. I thought it originated from somewhat behind me, but my partner said he heard it coming from away and to the front left of us. At any rate, it was loud, airborne, and passed quickly over us and away. I am very familiar with the sound drones make, and this was not it. It also wasn't a helicopter. The sound was too small, if that makes sense. And it wasn't a bird. It sounded too mechanical. It was flying very low, probably just above the tree line. We couldn't see a thing. The second thing happened about a week ago. We weren't in the stand, but it was weird and out of the norm. So I'll mention it here. We live on the same property that the stand is on. It was around 9 or 10 at night when all of a sudden there was a distant boom-like explosion, which hit our home like a thud. If you've ever spent any time around heavy artillery or explosives, you'll know what I mean. It was strong enough that my sister-in-law, who lives down the road, called us, asking what in the hell had just happened. It could have been a natural gas explosion, but the weird part is that my partner did some internet digging and a local emergency management website had posted asking for any info on an unknown explosion. This was back in 2016, during the same time of year. We still have no clue what it was. And then lastly, tonight, we were out in the stand once again. It's gotten cold and we had a ton of rain all day. So everything was damp and dripping. We went out at 10 and it was about 10.30. I was preoccupied with trying to keep my fingers and toes warm when suddenly I become aware of a weird murmuring. My partner heard it too, but he has hearing damage, so I don't think he heard the full breath of the tones. To me, kind of sounded like muffled voices off in the distance, like someone's having a conversation too far off to make out what the person is actually saying. But the direction the sounds were coming from doesn't have any buildings or dwellings. It's just wood. And there were several different tones. My partner said it kind of sounded like a cow moaning, but not quite. There are cattle in the area, and we hear them vocalizing all the time. This wasn't that. And there isn't any grazing land in the vicinity of the sound's origins. They carried on for maybe 30 seconds, slightly rose in a crescendo, and then died off and faded away completely. I want to stress how indistinct those sounds are. If I hadn't been listening intently, I don't know if I would have heard it. All of this, occupied with the general gut feeling I have whenever I'm out in the dark alone, has me worrying. I don't necessarily feel in danger, just generally watched and noticed. I have very good instincts, and I try to listen to them. I'd love to know what you all think. There may be rational explanations for all these phenomenon. All I know is, I don't want to be another hunter with another creepy story, but I feel like I'm starting to see a bell curve emerge. Thank you for listening. The first night we're there, my friend was coming down with a cold, so she went to bed much earlier than me. On the trip to South Dakota, we talked about random weird stuff, as two best friends do on a long road trip. One of the things being we're both very adamant about closing the toilet lid before we flush. We're both huge germaphobes. So closing the toilet lid before we flush is a habit we both had for the longest time, as I can recall. Weird fact, but it is relevant. 
She's asleep by the time I finish my dinner and shower. Like any God-fearing American, I use the bathroom before I get in the shower. After I get out, I go check on her because I'm a little worried about how she's feeling. She's absolutely crashed in her room. I can see her breathing and hear her snoring. After I check on her, I decided to try and go to sleep. The Airbnb is a pretty small trailer sitting right next door to the host's trailer. The host is rated as a super host. No reviews out of the ordinary. My friend's room is on the other side of the trailer. Then the common area, with the entrance that opens directly into the living room, dining room area, and kitchen. The door to my room is right next to the kitchen drawers and sink. My friend sleeps with her door open. I sleep with mine shut. I fall asleep quickly, but after a few hours, I wake up because I can hear what sounds like drawers rolling on their tracks outside my door. Now, my friend has been known to sleepwalk, so I think that's what it is. I'm wondering what to do when I realize I really need to use the bathroom. I'm not mentally prepared to go out and see my friend sleepwalking, honestly, because it's always freaked me out a bit, even though I know she can't help it. I open the door, and there's no one there. No drawers are open. Nothing looks out of place, and it wasn't a matter of minutes passing since I had heard it. It had been seconds. Even if my friend had sprinted back to her room on the other side of the trailer, I would have definitely heard her. I'm trying to rationalize everything as I make my way to the bathroom. Like maybe some animal was doing some weird stuff under the trailer and it just happened to sound like drawers. However, when I got to the toilet, something is immediately off, and it takes me a second to realize what. The toilet lid is not only up, but there is pee in the bowl. No TP, though. Me and my friend are both females. I'm like, what the fuck? So I text her and say, I'm trying to just chalk all this up to you sleepwalking. And I tell her what all has happened. After I finish my business, I go to check on her again. And it really seems like she hasn't moved an inch. Not rolled over. Not even pulled the covers up. I'm just like, what the fuck? But I'm determined to enjoy my trip. So I trot back to my room and lay down and try to go back to sleep. Any sleep I get was super light. And I woke up a lot, but I didn't hear anything else. My friend woke up at 4.30 to officially use the bathroom, saw my text, and just kind of said, maybe? And we left it at that for the day. Neither one of us wanted to talk about it more at the time. So when we wake up, we head out early after breakfast for a full day of hiking in the Badlands. And it was honestly amazing. Beautiful scenery, great hikes. We saw a ton of wildlife. The events of the night were put out of my head. Even when we got back to the Airbnb, I was like, I was probably just spooking myself because I'm in a new place far from home. We eat dinner, take our showers, lay down. I fall asleep quickly because all the exertion has worn me out. But this night, around two to three, I think, I wake up because there is a steady scratching on the wall outside my room. It had been going on for so long that it had woven itself into my dream and I was having a nightmare about some monster coming after me. The details about the nightmare aren't really clear anymore, but I remember the absolute terror I felt when I woke up to that noise. I know some people would say, it's just scratching, it's not a big deal. But it sparked some kind of primal fear in me. I texted my friend and asked her if she could hear it. As soon as I texted her, the noise just stopped. No taper off, just abruptly stopped. She texted back a few hours later and said she hadn't heard anything. But if I was scared, I could come sleep with her. She also offered up the idea of it possibly being a wild animal, being attracted to the smell of the food 
we had been cooking earlier. I just held on to that idea and let it be. The beds weren't very big, so I opted to stay in my own room. Now that I had a semi-logical explanation. The thing is, the trailer was lifted, and the place on the wall that was being scratched was high up. Again, I push any further thoughts out of my mind and try to go back to sleep. We have one more day of hiking in the Black Hills, then one more night, then we're headed back home. Custer CP in Black Hills NF is beautiful, one of my most favorite parts of the trip. But the whole time, I'm terrified of getting separated from my friend for some reason even though it's broad daylight and we're on a very popular trail. So, that was weird. We do our hikes there, then head back to our Airbnb for our final night. At this point, I'd like to add that as two young females, we try to be as safety conscious as possible. Location sharing with multiple friends and family members. She has a gun she is licensed to carry. I have pepper spray and wasp spray that I keep on me at all times. We move stuff in front of the door to block the entrance in case the creep were to break in. And of course, we kept the doors and windows locked. We checked every window as soon as we got there the first night. We checked under the beds every night. Again, it's a smaller trailer and not a lot of hiding spots for creepers that we wouldn't think to look for. We had agreed to leave at about 7 in the morning to head home. However, about 5 a.m., some things happen simultaneously. The scratching noise wakes me up. It had been going on for so long that it had worked its way into my dream again. I was dreaming of a big cat that was stalking us while we were trapped in the wilderness. When I wake up and grab my phone to text my friend, it immediately stopped. I see my friend has already texted me. She asks, Do you hear that? I think she's finally hearing the scratching, so I text back and say, Yes. I walk into the living room where she is, and I see that she's so freaked that she has her gun out. She's been through courses. She knows not to draw your weapon unless you know there is a clear and present danger, and you're prepared to shoot. She was that scared. She doesn't scare easily. I asked her what's going on and she said, I woke up because I heard a whirring noise, almost like a moaning or a low noise. I did not hear this, by the way. Then I, I heard shuffling and footsteps in the kitchen. I sat up in bed and I realized my door had been shut. That's when I texted you and grabbed the gun. A couple of things. She slept with her door completely open every night. The heat kicking on never closed it. She wasn't tall enough to kick it shut. Even nudging it with her finger wasn't forceful enough to shut it all the way. It had to be pulled shut. Also, we would have heard someone coming in, one of the windows or the door. Everything was locked tight. We checked every night before bed. Also, the morning before, I had walked around the trailer looking for signs of damage where the scratching was. There were none. I also looked for a loose spot where an animal could have gotten under the trailer to make noises we were hearing in the kitchen. There were none. My friend asked me what I wanted to do. The sun wasn't due to be up for a while longer. But at that point, I am pissed. I haven't had a good night's sleep in several days. I say, let's just load up and go. Keep your gun out and ready. We don't have a lot, so it's not going to take us that long and get all this stuff into the car. So that's what we do, and we get the fuck out of there. Also, three nights there, and we didn't see the moon a single time. We even Googled it, and it was supposed to be right around a quarter to a half a moon, so definitely should have been visible. We could see all the stars. It wasn't overcast at night. We kept remarking on how weird it was. 
That morning as we were leaving, the moon was there, really brightly. Like, this might be stupid, but I don't know if it just rises later in South Dakota or what, but sometimes we got back to the Airbnb late. It was just weird. We messaged the Airbnb host twice about it. She was one of those hosts that was labeled as super responsive and replies within an hour. She refused to respond to our messages with any kind of explanation. We even kind of offered our own, a wild animal of some kind, that she could have just cooperated, but she wouldn't even do that. However, I don't believe it was an animal at this point. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't that. After we put many hours between us and there, and the sun came up, my friend finally said, I wanted to tell you what I really saw the first night in the park, at the Pinnacles Outlook, and proceeded to tell me about the humanoid figure. She also said she didn't feel like she had been sleepwalking at all while we were there. Before I wrap this up, number one, I checked the Airbnb host's page several times since then. All great reviews. No mention of anything similar to what we experienced. We left a three-star review. We tried to put what happened to us in as normal terms as possible. Again, chalking it up to an animal possibly. Our host left us a great review while still never responding to our questions. And number two. I went on another hiking trip with my husband about a month and a half later. I heard scratching on this trip as well, but I was immediately able to say, that's a squirrel or something similar, and it did not bring a sense of absolute primal fear and the feeling of being hunted, even while you were laying in bed where you're supposed to be safe. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but this one popped up in my brain the other day, and I've been thinking about it a lot and can't really explain what happened, so I thought I'd share. About two years ago, in the dead of winter, my power went out. This was a big problem for me because I have a pet leopard gecko who requires heating elements to survive. It started getting very cold in my apartment, very quickly, to the point I became worried about my pet's safety, and did the only thing I could think to do, which was to take my gecko to my car and crank the heater up. Normally, we get a few power outages every winter in my area, and they last maybe an hour or two. This one was different, because the power did not come back on for six hours. After about an hour sitting in my driveway, I get extremely bored and started driving around my neighborhood, which had some more rural areas that butted up against the National Forest. One of these areas is an absolutely beautiful overlook where you can see miles of the forest and also a few streetlights, so I'd be happy to see if the power came back on. So I drove there and parked to enjoy the view. I'd had the heat running for a while and the car has gotten a bit hot, so I rode down the window to let in some cool air and almost immediately started hearing something kind of far off at first. Kind of a weird, sad sounding howl mixed with a squawk. I assumed this was an animal but rolled up the window almost all of the way just in case. Over the next 20 minutes, the sound got progressively closer and closer to the car until it sounded like it was circling me. I can still hear this sound in my head clear as day, even though this happened several years ago. And I know what animals we had locally and what they sounded like. This didn't sound like any of them. I got nervous and decided to leave and go get some food and gas in the neighboring town that still had power. About another hour passes and there's still no power. Having convinced myself the sound was just an animal 
and it had probably long since moved on. I went back to the overlook to enjoy my meal. About another hour goes by without anything happening. No noise, no nothing, until eventually I see movement among the big rocks in front of me. It's starting to get dark, so I can't really make it out perfectly. But at one point, it looked like the head of a disfigured animal peering at me over a rock and then disappear. I see this several more times, but I stay because if it was an animal there, maybe something was severely wrong with it. Be it an injury or a birth defect, that would probably affect its quality of life. And I wanted to be able to let the animal control know so they could find it help and put it out of its misery if necessary, since it was clearly staying in that exact area. After a while, it starts making noise again. The same one as before, but now it's also added this horrible gurgling and sounds almost human. At this point, it's gotten completely dark and I can't see much of anything, but I can still hear it circling the car. Eventually, I hear what sounds like something messing around near the back tire, and I panic and peeled out of that damn parking spot. I look behind me and see what is now very clearly a person in the taillight. They attempted to chase the car for a few feet, but quickly gave up. Is it possible this was just a person under the influence or suffering from a mental health issue? Yeah, it definitely was. But this seems pretty unlikely since it was probably below 30 degrees outside and far enough out of everyone's way. I doubt anyone would be hanging out up here, let alone hanging out there for hours and wearing what appeared to be an animal skin on their head. If it wasn't a person, based on the location and how the thing looked, it was probably a skinwalker. This experience still terrifies me to this day. I believe I may have a recording of the sound that I will try and find. If I can find it, I will post it, but due to the power outage, I didn't film or record most of the experience to conserve my already dying phone. I purchased a hunting property in Southern Maryland a few years ago. It's a decent chunk of land over 400 acres, almost entirely wooded. Its history goes all the way back to the 1660s when it was deeded to some English military colonel. It has an old plantation-style house built in the 1870s. We were told the original school had burned down. It has a family cemetery with gravestones that go back to the 1780s and a lot of overgrown boxwood bushes, the ones you prune into shapes. The place did seem a little creepy right off the bat, but I've always been a pragmatic kind of person. I didn't give that stuff a second thought. The land had been leased by a hunting club for the past 20 or so years. All the stands were set up and trails were already established. It was a perfect fit for us. At one point, I made an off-handed joke to the hunting club guy about the haunted house. It really does look like one, I swear. He said something along the lines of, Yeah, this place will make your hair stand up on end sometimes. He seemed surprisingly serious. I thought he was going to make a joke back about it, but again, didn't make much of it but it stuck out in my head. He seemed surprisingly serious. I thought he was going to make a joke back about it. Again, didn't make much of it, but it stuck out in my mind. The house was unlivable at the time of purchase, so we were commuting back and forth from a friend any time we needed to be down there to get work done. I had never been there at night by the time deer season came around. Me and four other guys went opening day for rifle. We have to get our stands pretty early when it's still dark. 
We each go alone to different stands in different areas. First light is usually around 6.15, so we got there at about 5.15. It's about the 15 minute hike through the woods to the stands I was at. Opening day, no issues. Nothing weird happened. Kind of slow morning. Saw a couple of deer, but nothing worth taking. Second day, same schedule. Got there at 5.15 and started my hike out. Part of this hike is on a long and straight logging path. Once I got on this logging path, I started to get the sense that someone was watching me. The feeling came out of nowhere. I've hunted since I was a kid and have had deer snort and stomp at me in the dark. I know the wildlife is always watching, but this felt very different. I shined the flashlight through the trees in all directions, didn't see anything, and chalked it up to being paranoid because of what the hunting club guy said. It was an intense feeling. I got to my stand, which is what we call a ladder stand. It's basically a ladder going up a tree with a seat at the top. I got situated and was looking down at my phone since it was still dark. Out of the top of my vision, I see a bright light. I looked up real quick, and it was a blush white glow that lasted about two seconds at about 150 to 200 yards out straight ahead. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. I thought to myself, what the hell was that? The next closest hunter was probably close to about 500 yards away, but to my left. There's no way I could have ever seen his light through the trees. I kept my stare at the same spot for what felt like forever, but never saw it again. I ended up trying to justify it in my head as either like seeing stars or maybe a hallucination of some sort. Around 9 or 10 a.m., I got down and walked in that general direction to see if I could see anything really quickly, but there was nothing. We're on private land. There's no one else out here. Two guys got deer that morning. I did not. Decided not to mention the light to anyone. It was probably just in my head anyways. Day three. We switched up who went to which stand since the two guys who got deer weren't there. One of the guys did end up going to the stand I was at. Let's call him John. That day went on as normal, but was another bummer. None of us saw anything worth taking. John didn't mention anything out of the ordinary, and by that point, I had started to forget about the light and didn't care anymore. Day four. It was our last day and was another normal day, but thankfully, I had finally gotten my deer. A small seven point, but I was happy. John ended up taking a spike, a small buck. For the meat and the other guy decided not to take anything. We all went our separate ways. A couple weeks later, I decided to put up some trail cams and sent out a text to the group with a joke about maybe catching the old colonel wandering around. That's when I got a call from John, and he told me he forgot to tell me that he saw lights in the woods at the same stand I did. My heart dropped. I said, dude, you're not going to believe this, but I saw the same thing. I asked what color it was and in what direction. He said it was like a bright blue or white straight out. Said it was quick, on and off, so he couldn't say exactly. I thought for sure at that point the place was haunted, but had to go out there. I immediately drove down and scoured the area in front of that stand. After about a 15 minutes walking around in the vicinity of where I thought the light was, I found an old ladder stand. It looked like it had been there for a long time, maybe five to 10 years. Still could be used, but it wouldn't be safe. We had a poacher on the property. I called the game warden, but she said unless I caught the guy, there was nothing they could do. 
just told me to take the old stand, which I did. I set up cameras up in that area and never saw anyone. I wish I had told John about the light. I still feel like an ass. It was an incredibly dangerous situation, especially for the both of us. Thankfully, nothing bad happened. It's been about three years since then and haven't had any issues. I've done a lot of walking looking for old stands and I actually have found a couple more I took down. I tell everyone now who hunts there to tell me if they see anything out of the ordinary. So to give you a little bit of a background information on this story, which is 100% true by the way, I would like to start with the fact that I am European. I posted another story a couple months back about something that happened to me in Tuscany, Italy. As for me and my friends in this story, we are from Spain, and when this happened, at the end of September 2023, we were fairly new to the USA. I moved here a while back for law school, and so did my friends. We had been living here for a few months and decided to explore the nature of this beautiful continent, as we all lived in New York City. So, long story short, we decided to go on a road trip to Canada, drive around Lake Ontario, and then drive back to New York City through upstate New York. I am a dude, and my friends were three females. For the sake of anonymity, let's call them Lisa, Anna, and Charlotte. Everything went super smooth until the last night. So, for our last night, we had rented an off-grid cabin in a remote area in the woods in upstate New York to give some locals an idea. We were like half an hour drive from Harrisburg, I think. Me and Lisa had decided to spend one night in the cabin because it was one with nature. The cabin was super old, made from logwood, and there was no running water or electricity. Both me and Lisa had experience with survival in the wild in Europe. I, for myself, had been a Boy Scout my entire life, and even was a scout leader for a while. Our other two friends were, as much as I love them, purebred city girls. They had pretty much zero experience while camping, or to just be in a place where there is no service for the phones, as was the case in this cabin. We had been driving all day to get there, and when we reached the beginning of the forest, it was already past 10 p.m., and it was really dark that night. While driving to this place, we lost internet connection with the GPS, and so I had to drive to the cabin on intuition, paired with a good old-fashioned map, hoping for the best while trying to drive safe on these muddy trails. It was also raining the whole day. On the way there, Anna and Charlotte were in the back of the car, and the moment they lost phone service, they got pretty uneasy for the rest of the ride. All of a sudden, in the pitch-black darkness of the forest, we all saw a campfire, but there was no houses around or people. Just a campfire, a well-organized one, since the fire was not spreading and it was not as big as a bonfire. It kind of startled all of us as this was a little bit weird since there was no one around and we were really deep in the forest already. Plus, it was getting very late. When this happened, we also reached the end of the trail, and we figured we had taken the wrong trail at the crossroads before. So I turned around, and we were on our way again. Half an hour later, and a couple of wrong trails later, we finally had arrived at our destination, as we could finally see the first glimpse of this godforsaken cabin in the middle of nowhere. To give you an idea of how old it was, the potty was made out of wood and was on the outside of the cabin. When we arrived, it was still raining, and both Anna and Lisa were definitely not in the mood for getting out of the car and get in a cabin with zero lights. 
So me and Lisa left the lights in the car on and went inside the cabin, while also using our phone flashlights to check the cabin out and see if we could find any old flashlights, which we did, and to see if we could turn on the fireplace, which we didn't because all the wood was still wet from the rain and it seemed no one had prepared dry wood anywhere. So with a couple of old flashlights and a small improvised fire I managed to make in the stove, we all four got in the cabin and I started to make some pasta for us. Meanwhile, the girls were preparing the beds and closing the windows since it was already cold in this part of the state. The cabin had a small ladder which led to an elevated room and space with a bed where all three of the girls could fit in. And I would sleep downstairs in a bunk bed that seemed older than the First World War. While making pasta, Anna, one of the city girls, came up to me and, knowing that both Lisa and Charlotte did not like to hear anything scary at night, told me that she had seen an old cemetery in the middle of the forest on the way to our cabin, and that she had seen a figure walking around there. I first laughed it off as nothing, as I mentioned in my previous story. I do not consider myself a big believer of scary stuff. Being from Spain, we take promises very seriously. To swear on God is very serious for us. And she swore to God that she was not lying. I told her then that I believed her, but there was no need to panic as I would lock all the doors when we would go to sleep. We had some pasta, managed to make a couple s'mores, which are lovely by the way, and drank a couple beers, or at least I did. They all just had one. I can assure you that I am not drunk after a couple of beers, and that I would never start to hallucinate. Just saying in case anyone thinks I saw stuff because of the beer. They all three went to sleep pretty early after finishing the s'mores and their beer. And I, considering that I really love the outdoors, and that I don't really mind a little bit of rain, decided to take my last beer and a flashlight outside to the front porch, also very old and made of wood, and sat myself down with my beer while enjoying the sound of rain and the lovely sight of not seeing a single light in the distance. I could greatly appreciate this coming from New York City, and I just scanned the area around with my flashlight. There was nothing much really to see besides a lot of trees and a small creek a little further away. All I could hear was the wind, the rain, and the running water down in the creek. That was until I suddenly heard what I would only describe as a weird roar. The first thing that came to my mind was a bear but I had researched well before our trip, and I knew bears were not common at all in this part of the state. I also know what a bear roar would sound like, and it did not resemble a lot, except from the fact that it was a deep roar, if you get what I mean. Startled, but not really scared, I continued to scan the rest of the forest for as far as I could see from the porch. It was then when my eye caught glimpse of a figure, well hidden deep into the tree line. I would describe the figure as tall. As a reference, I am 6'4", and I thought this thing was at least a foot or two higher than me. It was well hidden because with its brown fur, that is what I think it was at least, or the skin in any case, blended in well with the trees in autumn. It was definitely aware of our presence as I saw two eyes glimpsing into my flashlight. I could not tell you what it was, but I swear to God that it was not a bear. It was bipedal and had rather long arms, I would say. We looked at each other for what seemed like an eternity, but in reality, it was more like five seconds before it vanished behind a tree and I heard another roar. It was then when I felt all of my hair stand up and I was definitely very much scared. I went inside as soon as I could and locked all the doors and closed every curtain. 
I quickly went to the bed and tried to wave it off as just my exhaustion from driving on day, playing tricks on my mind. But I promise you, this was very real. After an hour or so, I had calmed down and finally fell asleep. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the next morning, when I went to relieve myself after having drank beer the night before, the weather had cleared and it was rather sunny. And as far as I could see, the forest was calm and beautiful. No sight of any animals or anything abnormal. We had a nice breakfast that morning and left for our way back to the city that never sleeps. And so ends also my story of that night. I never talked about what I saw that night because I know all three girls did not like to hear scary stories. And I figured, after these months, that this was the best place to share it. If anyone has any idea of what it could have been, feel free to enlighten me, especially if it is backed up with rational reasoning. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these backwoods and middle-of-nowhere stories. I do apologize for this one being short, but you've got a surprise coming later that all of you will enjoy. I'd like to take a moment and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Batty's Knees. Thank you all for your continued membership and support of Back to Ashes. If you are asleep, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.